Okay, so today we're very happy to have Matthias Gabriel from ETH, and he'll be telling us about an exact ADS CFD duality. Please go ahead, Matthias. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak to you. It would be even nicer to be in Chicago, but uh, some other day this will be possible again. So I want to report some work uh, I've uh, done mainly with uh, Rajesh Kupakuma and Lawrence Eberhard over the last uh, few years. And um, so let me, oh, where does it go? Okay, so it's been long suspected, or I mean, maybe known that the CFT dual of string theory on say ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, it's a CFT that lives on the same moduli space as the CFTs that also contains the symmetric orbifold of T4. So the symmetric orbifold of T4 is you take uh, N copies of T4 and then you, so you let the permutation group act on the N copies and you make it orbifold invariant and the orbifold theory of that is a specific 2D CFT. And the belief is that the CFT dual of string theory on this background is a CFT that's connected by an exactly marginal operator to this specific symmetric orbifold CFT. Now, while this has sort of been known for, for many years, what's, what's not been clear is how the different points in this uh, different moduli spaces exactly correspond to one another. So on the CFT moduli space, as I've just explained, there's one very specific point, there's some very special point, namely the point that's described by the symmetric orbifold theory itself. And that point, the question is what precise string background does this point correspond to? And conversely, on the string side, there is a, 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 a part of uh, the moduli space that is described by an exactly solvable world sheet theory in terms of an SL2 hours Romino written model, the Maldesina Oguri description of uh, string theory in ADS3. And you can ask which, uh, which uh, specific CFT in this moduli space of CFTs does this uh, family of solvable world sheet theories correspond to? So that I think for many years uh, has not been understood clearly how these two things are really related to one another. <clears throat> now, I think the only consensus was that the actual symmetric orbifold theory, so this special point on this moduli space is not on anywhere on this blue line. And the reason for this is that the West Romino written model describes the background with pure Nevis Schwartz, Nevis Schwartz flux. I mean, that's the reason why there is a perturbative string description. And that is known to have long string solutions, i.e. strings that live near the boundary of ADS. And near the boundary of ADS, their spectrum is redshifted. And as a consequence, the excitation spectrum forms a continuum. And if you compare this to the degrees of freedom to the physical states that the symmetric orbifold has, there is no sign of any continuum. I mean, it's a rational CFT. There is, a, there is nothing continuous about the spectrum here. So the, the, the basic conclusion was that uh, this Vesumino written model, these specific points that you can describe here, will not be dual to this specific point here, namely the symmetric orbifold theory. Now, this is, I think, uh, what, what many people <coughs> think for a very long time. And uh, so some years ago, Rajesh uh, Kopakuma and I observed that uh, the uh, the symmetric orbifold theory has quite a remarkable property. Namely, I mean, in some sense, that's maybe also obvious and many people maybe implicitly knew it, but it has a very large symmetry algebra. If you think of it as a CFT person, the chiral algebra that characterizes the symmetric orbifold theory is gigantic. It contains all the, all the chiral, the symmetrized chiral fields of T4. And in particular, it contains uh, what one may call a W infinity algebra, <clears throat> a certain chiral algebra that has infinitely many fields of higher and higher spin. <clears throat> now, in recent years, it's become clear that such a W infinity algebra is the hallmark of showing that the corresponding dual string theory <clears throat> should have a higher spin subsector, namely a sector of massless higher spin fields, because the, the chiral higher spin fields of the symmetric orbifold theory will be du dual to massless higher spin fields on the ADS space. So what you learn from that is that <clears throat> the symmetric orbifold theory should be dual to string theory, including a higher spin spectrum. And you believe on general grounds that that will happen near the tensionless point where the, 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 the ratchet trajectories come down and lead to infinitely many massless higher spin degrees of freedom. Now, the tensionless regime <clears throat> is the deeply stringy regime. It's the regime where the string is tensionless, i.e. 
where it is as large as the space in which it propagates because there is no tension to, to, to tie it down to a small object. It's sort of floppy and it can explore the entire space. So what this should mean that from the point of view of say the West Romino written description, that should mean it should, uh, the, the, the thing that's closest to the tensionless limit in the context of these West Romino written models are the theories where the level of the SL2R sector which is basically the size of the ADS3 space in string units takes the smallest possible value because that's the, that's the regime where you would expect to have some tensionless limit, which in turn you expect to be dual to the symmetric orbital theory. So what this line of reasoning suggests is that if there is any chance of relating this Wessermino written description to the symmetric orbifold, you should look at the place where the Wessermino written model is at the smallest possible level because that's where it's more or less tensionless or has a chance to be tensionless, has a chance to contain a higher spin subsector and therefore has a chance to be dual to the symmetric orbifold theory. So this was our reasoning. And obviously there's a, there's a leap of faith to say, okay, maybe this has a chance. So let's just go ahead and study it. So what we did is we just studied systematically the level one SL2 hours will be the written model uh, systematically. Now, this is a little bit subtle and uh, I'll, in, in, Further on, I'll, I'll explain to you what's a clean way of describing this. Many people will say k equals one doesn't exist. And uh, this is a bit of a subtle point, but as I'll try to convince you, there is a very natural way in which you can explain what you mean by the level one ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 background. And what we've shown is that this is a solvable world sheet theory. So you can calculate its space time spectrum and you can compare it to the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold. I mean, this is a, a solvable theory. So you just can go ahead and systematically work out all the physical states and work out all their charges. And what we found is that the spectrum of this theory reproduces exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4. And when I say exactly, I mean exactly. I mean, not just the BTS part, the full single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold in the larger end limit is exactly the physical spectrum of this k equals to one Wessomino written model description of string theory in ADS3 cos S3 cos T4. So this was the first piece of evidence that the spectrum agrees. And subsequently, we've also managed to show, and this is actually what I want to concentrate on in this talk, because some members in the audience have heard me talk before. So I want to give it a slightly different slant than I've given in previous talks. We've also shown that actually the correlation functions of the symmetric orbifold can be reconstructed from the world sheet and the specific features that characterize correlation function of the symmetric orbifold are indeed microscopically visible in this world sheet description. And I'll spend some time explaining in detail how this comes about. So in our opinion, this is very strong evidence for the fact that this is really exactly the same point in moduli space. And therefore this gives you an example where the dual CFT you have under complete control, it's a perturbative CFT, but the dual string theory you also have under complete control because you have a world sheet description of it in terms of a solvable world sheet CFT. And therefore this is a, a, an example of an ADS CFT of a stringy ADS CFT duality where both sides of the correspondence are under quantitative control and you can really go and ahead and explore all sorts of aspects of this correspondence. So this is what most of my uh, talk will be about. Towards the end, I also want to explain uh, some very recent development, which is that we've managed to, in some sense, go the other way. I mean, it, you may say this is a bit unnecessary and to a certain extent, that's true. That's not really necessary in order to establish this duality. But if you want to see how this duality fits into how people think about dualities of this kind, what we've been trying to do is to see whether it fits into this reconstruction program of uh, Rajesh Kopakuma that he proposed some 15 or so years ago. And the idea there was that starting from the, the CFT dual uh, or from the Feynman diagrams of the CFT duals, that there is not, a way of reconstructing the correlation functions of the world sheet theory to which it's dual. And what we've recently seen that you can actually make this program very nicely work for the symmetric orbifold correlators and rewrite them in terms of an integral over string moduli space and thereby recover the integrand as being the integrand of the world sheet theory that was dual to this uh, weakly coupled CFT. So this is in some sense a tangential development, but I think it's an important development because it shows that 
while you may think that this three-dimensional, two-dimensional duality is a bit of a, an outlier, something a bit exotic, what at least this argument suggests is that at least with respect to this aspect, it fits quite naturally into what you would expect these ADS-CFT dualities to look like in other dimensions. So it's not just some curious, bizarre example. Maybe it really teaches us lessons that are more applicable also more broadly. So this is what I want to explain towards the end of my talk. So, so this, is, uh, this was my, my brief introduction. And what I want to do is uh, basically explain to you how you can get the spectrum of the CFT from the world sheet theory. Then the, the core of the talk will be to explain to you how, how you calculate the correlators of the CFT from the world sheet CFT. And then uh, ch chapter four is uh, explaining going the opposite way, I, how to go from the dual CFT to the world sheet theory. Uh, for this, this so far so only works in the large twist limit, which I'll explain to you uh, what we mean by that. And then I'll conclude and show you where we are hoping to go in the future. Okay, so let me start with uh, explaining to you how you can see that this world sheet theory really wants to be dual to the symmetric orbifold of T4. Now, as I alluded to before, the level one theory is a little bit tricky to write down in the NSR formalism, although I suspect that ultimately that will also be possible. But as uh, many of you may know, there is actually an alternative way of describing string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 in the so-called hybrid formalism that was pioneered by Berkowitz, Wappa, and Witten. Now, this formalism was developed with the aim of describing ramon ramon backgrounds, but you can, in particular, also apply this for pure unerwisch schwartz unerwisch schwartz flux. I mean, there is no reason why you have to go to Ramon backgrounds. You can also just apply it to pure unerwisch schwartz unerwisch schwartz flux. In, and in that case, it simply becomes a resumino written model based on the super Lie algebra PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 level K, where K is the level, the level of K is the number of uh, the amount of NSNS flux, together with a topologically twisted sigma model for the T4 degrees of freedom. So the PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2, that describes simultaneously ADS3 and S3. The bosonic subalgebra is uh, SU 1 comma 1, which is the symmetry of ADS3 plus SU2, which is the symmetry of S3. So this sort of encapsulates the entire ADS3 cross S3 piece of it. And uh, what's, what's, uh, what was tested some years ago is that for generic level K, uh, this uh, description agrees with the NSR description of the Maldesino Oguri. So this is just an alternative way of writing the Maldesino Oguri answer for certainly for K greater or equal than two. And there's very good evidence that this is exactly the same description as the Maldesino Oguri description. Now this theory, unlike, so as uh, some of you will know, the, the Maldesino Oguri description at level one is a bit delicate because the SU2, the supersymmetric SU2 will be at level one. And when you decouple the fermions, the bosonic SU2 would be at level minus one and you don't quite know what to do with that. But in the context of the hybrid formalism, you just look at the level one algebra PSU one comma one slash two and there's nothing particularly bad about PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 at level 1. There's nothing inherently sick about this uh, super Lie algebra. So what we have to do in order to describe this string theory is that we have to look at the representations of PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 at level 1. And as I alluded to before, the bosonic subalgebra is SL2 or SU 1 comma 1 and SU2. And both of them are at level 1 if PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 is at level 1. So as a consequence, you see, any, any representation, so if you ask what's, what are the allowed representations of PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 at level 1, they must be in particular allowed representations of SL2 level 1 plus SU2 level 1 because these are bos the bosonic subalgebras. But as many of you will know, SU2 level 1 has only two sets of highest weight representations, namely the J equal to 0 and the J equals to a half representation because SU2 level K has spins from 0 up to K over 2. So for k equals to one, it goes from zero up to a half, i a one-dimensional ground state or a two-dimensional ground state. That just follows from the representation theory of SU2 level k. Now, here we do not just have these bosonic subalgebras, we also have uh, fermionic modes, in particular fermionic zero modes. So we can ask, what are the generic highest rate representations? I, what are the generic representations of the zero mode algebra PSU 1, 1 slash 2? Now, the generic representation of the zero-mode algebra 
uh, takes this form. So you, 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 you write down each factor as a representation of SL2R, which I label by the spin of SL2R and alpha is this quantum number that describes the, 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 the J30 eigenvalues mod integers. And then the second entry is the dimension of the SU2 representation that uh, combines with it because you have SL2 plus SU2. So each factor you can describe in terms of representations of these two algebras. Now, because of the fermionic zero modes, you have eight fermionic zero modes. They basically map these representations to one another and a generic representation will take this form. I mean, that's just the usual way in which this uh, uh, Clifford algebra type representations look like. And because the fermions are doublets with respect to SL2 and doublets with respect to SU2, they move the representation either, they spin either down by a half or up by a half. And they move the representation spin of SL2R either down by a half or up by a half. So these are the, the sort of basic long multiplet you will get. Now, if you stare at this multiplet, you realize that if you start with a representation whose ground state, whose, 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 whose Fock vacuum, sits in the, reps in the n-dimensional representation of SU2, then somewhere in the middle of this multiplet, you find a representation that sits in the n plus two. I has spin one bigger than the spin of the SU2 representation from which we started. But remember, we, as our SU2 factor sits at level one, and therefore the only representations that are allowed is n equal to zero and n equals to one. So you can't possibly have a long representation. The long representations are simply incompatible with the structure with the null vectors of PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 at level 1. So what you learn from that is that the only representations that are allowed are short representations. And in fact, the only representations take exactly this form. They have a two dimension and a one dimension representation combined in this fashion. And as always, when you have a shortening condition for one of these multiplets, this is only possible provided that some quantum numbers take some specific value. And you work, when you work out what's the condition that this short multiplet is compatible with the, with the uh, commutation relations, what you find is that the spin must be equal to exactly a half. So what you learn from that is that the SL2R representations that appear here are not as you would have maybe generically expected of the former half plus IS, I part of the continuous spectrum. They must sit at the bottom of this continuum and in particular, this freedom that is described by this quantum number S that describes the continuous representations of SL2R is frozen out simply by the uh, consistency to be a fitting, to fit into a representation of PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 at level 1. In particular, and that's the key point, there is no continuum. And therefore, this, this generic argument why this Wesselmino Witten model cannot be dual to the symmetric orbifold doesn't apply anymore because this continuum somehow has disappeared in this very stringy setup that we are looking at, namely at this uh, very small level uh, scenario with the level being equal to one. Now, it's not that you can just see that you have no continuum. You can actually write out and uh, describe the representations that you get and the corresponding representations, the affine representations of PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2, they actually have very many null vectors. I mean, it's like, the way you should think about it, it's a little bit like SU2 at level one. SU2 at level one has gazillions of null vectors. And as a consequence, it behaves, it looks like a single boson rather than like three bosons as you would generically expect for SU2. So the character that the representation is much, much smaller than for generic values of K. And the same thing happens here, except it also happens in some sense for the SL2 factor. So what happens is that the generic representations look as though they've only got two bosonic degrees of freedom rather than the six you may have naively guessed. And then once you impose the physical state condition, I mean, this is a covariant description. So you get to, to, this eats up two uh, bosonic degrees of freedom. What you're left over with is that, it, that after you impose the physical state condition, the only thing that survives are the zero modes. So only basically the ground states of these representations, all the excitation modes are unphysical because A, you have zero many, many null vectors and B, you have imposed the physical the state condition. So then what happens is that this is basically the only piece that survives from ADS3 cos S3. And then from every state of T4, you have to impose the mass shell condition and it basically picks out one term from the zero mode sum. So what you see is that for every degree of freedom from T4, you get one state surviving as a physical state 
uh, of this uh, specific world sheet theory. And if you count it carefully and you calculate the quantum numbers in particular, you know that the conformal dimension in the dual CFT is to be identified with the zero mode J30 of the SL2R uh, currents. So you get not just the number of states, but you also get them including their the dual conformal dimension. And when you look at the entire spectrum, what you realize is that you get exactly the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbital fold of T4. So this comes out of this sort of microscopic analysis of this very specific world sheet theory. And what you observe is that this leads to exactly on the nose, the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbital fold of T4. So that's already a, a quite remarkable coincidence. I mean, it's not from the way you, you analyze this, it's not at all obvious that that's where you're going to land. In particular, it's not obvious that this condition, once you package all of this together and you work this out, you get exactly the conformal dimension as you would expect, but that's what happens when you, when you work this out carefully. Matthias, yes. earlier you said that the, um, that the T4 was topologically twisted in some way. Where does yes. that enter here? That doesn't enter much, but in order to write down the correct world sheet uh, CFT for this model, you have to topology. I mean, what this means is you shift up the conformal dimension of the fermions of the T4 to either be spin one or spin zero. I mean, that's what, the, what it amounts to, that, the, that, you, that, you, that uh, you change the stress energy tensor on the world sheet so that the, um, the, the fermions on the T4 become either spin zero or spin one. But in so terms of the counting, it doesn't do much. So from that perspective, you don't see much. So does that mean you're getting um, states that are natural living in the Ramon sector of the space-time CFT? No, 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 no. I mean, I mean, you get, I mean, you, I mean, as you know, you only get the Nova Schwartz. I mean, because we are doing perturbative string theory, the only thing you're going to see is the Nova Schwartz sector of the symmetric orbit fold of T4, because all of this works in the large end limit. And the Ramon sector has conformal dimension of order n higher than the Neve Schwartz sector and the large end limit that's sort of infinitely heavy. So you only see the Neve Schwartz sector of the, um, of the, uh, um, of the, uh, uh, of the symmetric orbit fold. But I mean, the way you should think about it is this is like the, this is like a green Schwartz like analysis, right? And so, so, I mean, the hybrid formalism is really trying to be green Schwartz. So, mm -hmm. So the fermions want to behave like, um, like I mean, the, the world sheet fermions want to be the space-time fermions and so on. And as a consequence, you have to topologize that, that. That's what happens. But for the calculation okay. of the spectrum, that has a very minor effect. As you know, it's okay. I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is, uh, this is how you get the spectrum. And now I want to explain to you how you get the correlators and what it means to get the correlators. And, and that's where I want to spend probably uh, the, the longest part of my talk on. So Matthias, before you, before you, you go there. Yes. Um, so the, the, the marginal operator in the symmetric product, um, where, where is that showing up in your, in your K equal one theory? So, so you mean that the modulus? Yeah, the modulus itself. Yeah, so, uh, so as you know, there, there are a number of moduli for the symmetric. So that the T4 moduli, they're just the T4 moduli. So they're not doing much. Yeah. And then the interesting one is the two cycle twisted sector modulus. Right. And the two cycle twisted sector modulus. So I, I, I skipped a little bit over that, but the, the, what, what will happen is that, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll explain it uh, here. The, the W cycle twisted sector states corresponds to the states that appear from spectral flow equal to W on the world sheet. So the two cycle twisted sector uh, marginal operator is a specific state that appears on the world sheet in the twofold spectrally flowed sector. So there's a specific world sheet vertex operator we can write down, but may maybe it'll become clearer how this, uh, how this, I mean, in particular, what I want to explain to you is that the correlation functions of the dual CFT are reproduced by the correlation functions of this corresponding operators in these spectrally flowed representations of the SL2R Vesemino Witten model. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, it's a bit complicated because it's in the second spectrally flowed sector. So integrating it is not the world's easiest thing to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the perturbation will be complicated from the world's perspective, but it's a definite physical state. And therefore you can, it's a exactly marginal operator on the world sheet and you can perturb it. Okay. But 
But what you have to do is you have to understand how to calculate this correlation function. And this is in some sense what I want to explain to you, at least in sketching how you can calculate these correlation functions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me remind you a little bit about the spectrum of, this, uh, of the structure of this symmetric orbifold. <clears throat> so as you know, an orbifold has an untwisted sector and has twisted sectors. The twisted sectors are associated to the conjugacy classes of the group elements. The conjugacy classes of uh, permutations are labeled by cycle shapes, i.e. partitions of n. And the idea is that what we are only going to see from the perturbative world sheet analysis are the single string states, and they should correspond by analogy to the single trace states for super -Ang mills, should be the single cycle sector states, i.e. the sectors, the twisted sectors, where the twist is a, by a group element that has one non-trivial cycle of length w, and all the rest are cycle of length one. And uh, our claim is, that if you look at the W cycle twisted sector, the states that come from there are exactly the physical states that appear in the W float, this W spectrally float uh, PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 representation of the world sheet. I didn't really mention this before, but as uh, some of you will know, this, the SL2R, the ADS3 spectrum, you have to include these spectrally float representations that come from this automorphism, and the same exactly applies for PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2. Now, what, what are the sort of things we want to reproduce from the world sheet? So I first want to explain to you a few facts about how to calculate the uh, correlation functions in the symmetric orbifold. And the simple thing to state are the fusion rules. So this is the question, which three-point functions are non-zero? Now, the fusion rules for the symmetric orbifold is the condition that the three Ws, Wi, J, and Wl, these are the three Ws characterizing the three twisted uh, sector states, must have the property that they sum up to be an odd number, and the sum of any two must be bigger than the third one minus one. That's the, that are, these are the fusion rules for the symmetric orbifold. So in particular, for example, if you choose any odd number, there will be a non-zero three-point function of the form w, 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 because you see that sum of the w of three odd numbers is odd, and any two is bigger than the third one because this is two W is always greater or equal than W minus one. So this predicts something quite unusual from the point of view of the world sheet theory. What it tells you is that the corresponding, there must be a non-zero three-point function of a W spectrally flows representation, vector vertex operator, another W spectrally flowed vertex operator, and a third W floats spectrally flowed vertex operator. Now, often people think of the, correlation functions on the world sheet uh, on this SL2 Arbeitsmann Witten model in terms of winding number violation, because the idea is that this winding number should basically just add. And what I'm saying here is that this can't be true if you want to reproduce the symmetric orbifold. It must be pretty non-true because there's, there's not at all that W is in any way close to the sum of the other two W. The winding number variation is big and is as big as you want. So this is, this is what we have to reproduce if we want to reproduce the symmetric orbifold theory from the world sheet. Now, just to illustrate how this goes, I mean, for example, the simplest example is to look at a three-point function of three twist three operators. And this is non-zero because as you know, I mean, what you have to do is you have to find a representative for each of these three cycle twisted sectors so that the product of the group elements multiplies to the identity. And there are three three cycle operators, three, three cycle permutations that multiply to the identity. And here's an example, for example, three, four, one, three, two, four, and one, two, three multiplies to the identity. If you start from here, this maps one to two, this maps two to four, this maps four to one. So you map one to one, two to three, three to two, and so on. So each number gets mapped to itself. So this combination is indeed the identity. So therefore this correlation function will be non-zero. And that's the reason why this correlation functions will be non-zero. So that's simply true in the symmetric orbifold. Now, how do you, what's an efficient way of calculating these symmetric orbifold correlation functions? Well, one idea that was pioneered by Lunin and Matur is that you should go to the, to the covering space, that you should think of the, the, the field in the W twisted sector as basically introducing a W fold multi-story car park. And you should think of it in terms of some covering of it where you have a W fold cover on top over the point where you insert this W uh, twisted sector field. Now this you have to do for each of the fields of your correlation function. So the idea is that you do this near each of these twist fields 
And then you want to glue together the different sheets of this covering in order to get a global covering map that has the property that near each of the twist fields, it has this property, but it doesn't have any other funny twist, uh, twist insertions. Otherwise it's uh, simply a regular holomorphic map from some Riemann surface down to the Riemann sphere with the insertion of these twist fields. Now, for example, for the example we discussed before, so if you ask about what's this, uh, for the case where you have a three, a three cycle uh, twisted uh, vertex operators, what's the covering map? That's the covering map if I choose the coordinates of the X and the Z. So the Xs are always the coordinates downstairs and the Zs are the coordinates in the covering map. So if I choose X and Z one for one of them to be zero, for one of them to be one and for one of them to be infinity, you see, because of Möbius symmetry, this is uh, without loss of generality, then the covering map that has this property is, for example, explicitly given by this formula. You see this map zero to zero, one to one, and infinity to infinity. And near zero, it behaves like Z cubed. Near infinity, it behaves like Z cubed. And near one, it also behaves like one plus Z minus Z, one, Z minus one cubed. And what you also see is that this describes a fourfold covering of the sphere by the sphere. You see, this has, this has uh, because this is a quartic polynomial in, numer in the numerator, there are, there are four pre-images for every point downstairs. And this has to do with the fact that in this way of writing it in terms of the permutations, you have what uh, uh, Pacman and Rastelli call four active colors, which is just to say that you need four different numbers in order to make this work. I mean, you need, I mean, in principle, you have as many numbers to pick from to pick your three cycle representations, but in order to find three of them that multiply to the identity, what works is that you take them to involve the numbers one, two, three, four, but you don't have to involve five numbers or six numbers and so on. So this is, this is uh, translating to the fact that you actually have a fourfold cover of the, of the downstairs sphere by the upstairs sphere. Okay, so, so, so this is uh, what you can do. You can sort of locally describe it. And then the idea is that suppose you're just looking at a W sector cycle twisted sector ground state, then once you've gone to the covering space by this holomorphic map, then somehow the effect of the twist has disappeared because in the covering space, there is no twist anymore. And because the ground set of the twisted sector is whose its, uh, its uh, role in life is to introduce the twisted sector. So once you have removed it by going to the covering space, there is nothing left behind. And what you're left with is just the vacuum correlator on the covering surface. But the vacuum correlator is just equal to one. I mean, say if the covering surface is a sphere, then the vacuum correlator is just one. It's the vacuum correlator on the sphere, which is just one. And therefore the entire correlator is computed from the conformal factor that is determined by the covering map. That's the structure, that's the idea for how to calculate these correlation functions. You simply work out the covering map, then you work out the conformal factor that's uh, induced by the covering map and this will tell you what the original correlator was because you've just used the conformal transformation to map it to a trivial correlator. And all the information about the original correlator is just in the map to the trivial correlator, namely in the covering map. So that's the, that's the idea with how, which one can calculate correlation functions in the symmetric orbit form. So for example, for the case of the three point function, when you do this, then what you get is you get something that's expressed in terms of parameters that appear in this uh, covering map. And what appears is the coefficient in front of the, the wi power uh, at the critical point. I mean, for z equal to zi, it gets mapped to xi and near xi, it has a w fold cover. So it has to be of this form. And the coefficient that appears here enters in the computation of the correlation function in this manner where HI is the conformal dimension of the state in the symmetric product orbit. So this is sort of the prescription a la Luni in Matur for how to calculate correlation functions in the symmetric orbit forms. So for example, our favorite example, three, 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 this is the covering map. If you expand it around zero, one or infinity, these are the expressions you get. And therefore you deduce that this parameter AI gamma is just equal to minus two and therefore the correlation function is just of this form with these factors all being minus two. So this is how you calculate the covering maps in uh, the, the, the correlation functions in the symmetric orbifold in principle. And it always boils down to finding the covering maps. <laughs>
Now, here I've discussed the situation where the covering surface is a sphere. In general, the covering surface may have higher genus. And if you analyze the, the, the one over n behavior of the correlation function of the symmetric orbifold, what you see is that the one over n behavior is at least to leading order in one over n captured by the genus of the covering surface that contributes to this correlator. This is uh, an observation that was, uh, I think, already made by Luna and Matur and then uh, sort of brought to prominence by Pakman, Rastelli, and Razamat. And you see, because we know that the, you would expect the string coupling constant of the dual string theory to be related to the n parameter of the symmetric orbifold as one over square root of n, this suggests that the genus that appears here, if you translate it with this dictionary, should be identified with the genus of the world sheet that contributes to this correlation function. So you will reproduce correctly the one over n behavior of these correlation functions if you can think of the covering surface as being the world sheet. That's what this analysis simply suggests. There is a very natural family of conformal surfaces appearing via these covering surfaces. They're naturally higher, higher in a genus. Their one over n behavior depends on the genus exactly as it should depend on the genus of the world sheet. And therefore the most natural idea is that the covering surface is the world sheet, or rather the world sheet is the covering surface. Now, at the time this was proposed, this was a, a very nice, very convincing proposal, but there was no way of testing it because nobody knew what the world sheet theory should be. But now we do know what the world sheet theory should be. So therefore we can simply go ahead and ask, is this true? Is it true that I'm going to get the CFT correlation function of the symmetric orbifold with their covering space picture by taking the world sheet correlation functions of my PSU 1, 1 slash 2 level 1 Vesumino Witten model plus the rest, integrate it over the world sheet uh, moduli, and uh, do I reproduce this answer? Now, we claim that you will, but in order to explain how this works, but there's one crucial fact that maybe people didn't quite uh, put enough attention to. And this is, has to do with how you should you define the vertex operators on the world sheet to describe vertex operators in the dual CFT. So, so obviously the, from our spectrum analysis, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between states and states. Now states in CFT, you, all, you can always think of as being the vertex operator inserted at zero. So if we insert this vertex operator at uh, zero in, on, the, on the world sheet, then, and, the state, then it'll just make a state and it'll make the state that also sits, if you wish, at zero in target space so that it describes the state of the dual CFT. So if you just sit at zero, then this is just the correspondence between the spectra. But then you know how in CFT you can move world sheet, you can, how you can move vertex operators around. What you do is you simply conjugate them with the translation operator. Now the translation operator on the world sheet is L minus one. So you have to conjugate it with E to the Z L minus one on both sides to move it from Z equal to zero to Z equal to Z. And then in the dual CFT, you should do exactly the same. So in the dual CFT, you also know what the translation operator is because the Möbius group of the dual CFT is to be identified with the zero modes of your SL2R currents. And therefore the translation operator of the, world sheet, of the dual CFT is J plus zero from the point of view of the world sheet. So you should also conjugate by e to the x j plus zero in order to describe the, the insertion of the dual CFT state, not at the origin, but at the position x on the dual CFT sphere. So there are two translations at play here and there are two coordinates at play here that are naturally appear, namely a world sheet coordinate and the coordinate of the space-time CFT. And the two operators, luckily commute with one another because you see the commutator of j plus zero with l minus one is zero. So therefore this is totally unambiguous what you mean by that. You just identify states and states and then you simply translate them by applying the corresponding translation operators on the world sheet and in target space. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to, so this is what we mean by this uh, world sheet coordinates, uh, uh, vertex operators and we have to calculate these correlation functions of these world sheet correlators. Now, before I get to that, there, there's one important thing one has to appreciate to see what sort of structure we need to find. And that has to do with the fact that 
if this idea that the cover that the world sheet is the covering surface is true, then the world sheet correlators must have a very surprising localization property. And the reason for that is the following. Suppose I fix the ZIs, the XIs, as well as the twist labels WI for all my endpoints whose endpoint correlator I want to calculate. Then if N is greater or equal than four, I, if I have more than three points, if I have three points, then it always works or it, there is no covering map at all. But when N is greater or equal than four, the covering map typically doesn't exist, but it exists on certain sub manifolds of certain co-dimensions. Now, maybe that sounds a bit abstract, but there is one simple example where this is totally obvious. And that's the example, if I look at the four point function where all the Ws are equal to one. Now in that case, there is really no twist and therefore the covering surface is also a sphere. And the covering surface, the covering map must have the property that it maps Zi to Xi. And obviously for any three points, I can map to any three points with a Möbius transformation. It must be a Möbius transformation because the any holomorphic map, the only holomorphic map from the sphere to the sphere are the Möbius transformations. So I can find one that maps any three points to any three points. But once I've done that, the fourth point is either going to the fourth point or it's not. This is to say there is only going to be a Möbius transformation or a, a, a covering map that maps Zi to Xi with all Ws i is equal to one for the four point case, if the cross ratios of the X's and the cross ratios of the Z's agree, otherwise there's no way I can make it. So what this must mean is that this correlation function, this four point function for the case where the, where the twist labels are all one must be proportional to a delta function where the argument of the delta function is the cross ratio of the X's minus the cross ratios of the Z's. i.e., the cross ratios of the, the space time coordinates minus the cross ratio of the world sheet coordinates. So that's what we expect we should be able to see. Now, this sounds bizarre. I mean, you don't expect CFT world sheet correlators to have this property. So something remarkable must happen in order for this uh, to work out. Now, what we did is that we decided to approach this totally systematically by simply trying to solve the word identities of the correlation of the correlators. I, so I mean, how would you solve a correlation function in a CFT, you would insert the currents and you would see what sort of constraints do you get by looking at correlation functions of that kind. Now, as I'll explain to you, you can do this and I'll explain to you in detail how it works, although it's a little bit subtle and that's probably the reason why nobody had tried to do it before. So, so how do you work out such a, a correlation function? Well, the usual idea is that you, if you know the OPE of each of these fields with each of them, then you can simply write down the answer because you simply write down all the poles and as a function of z. And then once you've written down all the poles, that must be the entire answer because uh, any holomorphic function is on the sphere is determined by its poles. So what are the poles? So let's first, uh, so there are three cases, j plus, j3, and j minus for the three generators of SL2R. So, so let's ask what, what is the OP of j plus with a W spectrally flowed vertex operator. Now, if you look at this for a W spectrally flowed vertex operator, you see in the W twisted sector, the, the action on the states is the mode numbers get shifted down by W. So as a consequence, you're going to get poles of order W plus one and the action of uh, J plus W corresponds to the action of J plus zero before spectral flow. And before spectral flow, what this means, it's just act on the ground states of this, uh, of this highest rate representation. And on the ground state, J plus zero acts as a conform as a certain factor and it shifts the M eigenvalue up by one. And because the, um, because the, uh, the, uh, the conformal dimension is really just M plus WK over two, what this basically does, it just shifts the conformal dimension up by one. So that's the leading term. Then you have all of the terms, you have no idea what they are. And then the last one is just the usual zero mode and the usual zero mode just by staring at this formula obviously acts like a derivative in spectra X. That's how it has to act because it's the translation operator in space time. So that's the structure of the OPE of J plus with a W spectrally flowed vertex operator. You have the usual term and then you have this higher order poles coming from the fact that you're looking at this W spectrally flowed representation. And the last one you have again, a simple description of because it describes something that was a zero mode before spectral flow. 
So that's what the OPE of J plus with a W spectrally fluid vertex operator looks like. What about the other two? Well, the other two is a little bit more subtle because you see here, for example, look at the J3 term. So the J3 term, there will be one term, which is the usual way, which will be just H times the vertex operator divided by Z minus Z term. That's just the J3 zero mode acting and that just gives you H. So naively you would think that's all there is to it, but you see, this vertex operator is defined by this formula. And when you take this J3Z past this e to the x j plus x, then because J3 and J plus don't commute, you pick up terms proportional to x that involves J plus. So you have the usual zero mode action plus terms that are all proportional to x and that come from the commutator term of the J3 modes with J plus and the fact that you had e to the x J plus uh, sitting here in front of your vertex operator. And likewise for J minus. For J minus it's regular. So you only get terms that are proportional to X. So that's the structure of the OPEs of the currents with the spectrally flowed vertex operator. It's a little bit complicated. It's much more complicated than uh, we are used to. And it has this funny dependence on X as a consequence of the fact that these vertex operators have this translation behavior with respect to the X coordinate. Now, once we've written this down, we can in principle write down all the correlation functions like that. As I said, you just write down the OPEs of, uh, of all the, of the J's with all the different uh, uh, VWI using the formulas I've used before. You just use this formula and then you can write down these correlation functions in terms of the correlators with shifted values of H and derivatives, but you're also going to pick up unknown terms or what we termed unknown terms, because in the OPE, you get these funny terms from the green boxes, which are the terms you don't know what they are. They are the terms with J plus L acts on the vertex operator, and L is some somewhere between heaven and hell. I mean, it's neither the last one where you not just know it is a derivative in X, or it's the first one where you know it acts as a zero mode before spectral flow, it's something in between. It's what you don't really know. It's why we call it an unknown term. So, so that looks like a disaster. I mean, now you've worked out these correlation functions, but you've worked them out in terms of stuff you don't know. You've worked it out in terms of, of correlators of this form, but there's a very specific class of correlators that appear, namely one of them will be decorated by a J plus L and L will run from one to WI minus one, where WI is the spectral flow of that specific vertex operator. Now, how can you make progress? Now you have written the correlator in terms of stuff you don't know, but, you have also lots of relations. Where do the relations come from? Well, the relations come from the fact that you see J minus, J minus really wants to be extremely regular because the spectral flow of J minus shifts the mode number upwards. So typically all the modes act as positive modes and kill. But because of this E to the X J plus zero, it doesn't quite trivially want to act uh, nil potently but you can decorate it by a suitable correction term that depends on xj so that you just pick up the term that uh, where j minus acts directly on the state and therefore has a, has a zero of order uh, wj minus two. So this combination of correlation functions which you've now all calculated in terms of all of these unknowns. So this you can write as an explicit formula in terms of these twisted, uh, these shifted correlators and the unknowns is equal to, must have this form. In particular, it must have a zero of order wj minus two. So there are some j wj minus one homogeneous equations from, from demanding that all of these regular terms are equal to zero. And these are as many homogeneous equations as you have unknowns. So you can use these homogeneous equations to eliminate the unknowns. And then you get a recursion relation for the remaining correlation functions that involve only these except that in general, they involve also shifted correlators in that the conformal dimensions have been shifted. So what you end up with is a system of equations that gives you relations between correlation functions, shifted correlation functions, original correlation functions and differential operators acting on the original correlation functions. It gives you a complicated set of recursion relations of all of these correlation functions among themselves. But you see, you've eliminated the current from it and you, you've, you've, you've obtained constraints on these correlation functions to see uh, what they have to satisfy. Now, unfortunately, 
these equations are quite complicated. I mean, the simplest way to explain it to you is what I've just done, which unfortunately is already quite complicated. There is no simple closed formula. We can simply work it out case by case. Well, we can write it out. In some sense, we can work it out in closed form, but we can't write down, we can't solve this system of equations in closed form. But what we can show is that this ansatz always satisfies all of these equations including a delta function term of the form relating cross ratios to cross ratios. And uh, so it has exact, and uh, including this factor that we've seen from the lunin Matua answer, but this only works provided that there is a magic identity between the spins and the level, which in its easiest incarnation tells you that if you take the level being equal to one, which is the case we are primarily interested in, then all the JIs have to be equal to a half, which is anyway what will happen for the for this model because these are the only representations that are compatible with the PSU one comma one slash two level one uh, representation theory. So it's it's a quite intricate analysis. It relies on deriving all of these equations, but once you found them, while we can't prove while we haven't proven in this context that this is the only solution, what we've shown is that the solution that fits with the symmetric orbifold is a highly non-trivial solution to this extremely complicated system of uh, equations. And that, in our opinion, gives very strong credence to the idea that this really wants to reproduce uh, the symmetric orbifold correlation function. So for example, one, one thing you can see is that you can only solve for the unknowns if the fusion rule conditions on the Ws are satisfied. If the fusion rule conditions on the Ws are not satisfied, there is simply no solution because the, these, you know, these homogeneous equations uh, don't have any non-trivial solution. So you see the fusion rules emerging from this analysis and you see an explicit formula of this type being a solution to this complicated set of equations. Now, subsequently, and this was done a few months ago, so, so this analysis was really done on the level of SL2R, not paying any attention to SU2, not paying any attention to the, to the supergroup, but only looking at the SL2R factor. And uh, if you actually want to use the full power of the supergroup, then you can use the fact that PSU 1, 1 slash 2 has in fact a free field realization in terms of symplectic bosons and free fermions. And then there is a magic identity that relates the two of the symplectic bosons with the covering map inside the correlation function. So this is an identity you can analytically prove to be uh, zero. And uh, this smells very much like an incidence relation in a tista like description of string theory with psi plus and psi minus being the twister variable and this being the coordinate of the, of the space you are describing. So in this context, we've shown that these delta function localized solutions are in fact the only solutions because that follows directly from this twister-like identity, which we can also prove from first principles. But that's specific to this PSU 1, 1 slash 2 level 1 theory. In some sense, the theory we're most interested in, but using in, in particular, this free field realization in terms of symplectic bosons and complex fermions. Okay, so this is what I wanted to explain to you in some detail, how you can actually uh, calculate these correlators from the world sheet. And now in the remaining uh, five or whatever minutes I have, let me uh, briefly try to tell you how you can go the opposite way. So the opposite way consists of starting with the CFT uh, uh, correlation functions, which are given by sums over covering maps with, uh, with this structure. That's what the lunin Matua answer uh, predicts. And the problem in order to calculate this is always to find the covering maps. In principle, it's a difficult problem to find a covering map. So what we've uh, realized that there is actually a, 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 a mechanism, an idea by means of which you can find the covering map quite explicitly if you assume that a covering surface is also a sphere. So we are looking at only those sums of covering maps that contribute to leading order in one over N. These are the ones where the covering surface is also a sphere. And in this case, N, which is the number of sheets or the number of active colors is equal to one plus a half times WJ minus the sum over WJ minus one. So how, how can one characterize these covering maps? Well, there's a way in which you can encode the covering maps in terms of Feynman diagrams. And the idea is that you, so you're on your base sphere, you have the twisted, uh, the twist field sitting at positions x1 up to xn. You take a curve that runs through all of these twist fields and uh, encircles infinity. 
And then you look at the pre-image of this under the covering map. Now, because the covering map has this n-fold, it has an n-fold cover, each of these circles, there will be n circles in the pre-image. So here the picture is drawn for a four-point correlator with wi equals to five. So then n is equal to nine. So there must be nine, nine circles uh, that you find. And I've written this in this double line notation. So there must be, there are nine pink uh, circles, uh, nine pink surfaces that you find here, which are sort of the interior of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, Jordan curve downstairs lifted up and the exterior is, 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 is described by, uh, is, is kept white. Now the interior always contains exactly one point that's the pre-image of infinity. So these are these black dots. These are exactly the pre-images of infinity because the circle downstairs encircles infinity and therefore upstairs it must encircle a point that get mapped to infinity under the covering map, i.e. a pole of the covering map. Now, the idea is to look at this problem in a, what you may want to call a gross mender type limit, where you take the WIs all to be large, but you take them large in a sort of simultaneous manner, namely you take WI over N to be fixed while you take WI large. When you take WI large, obviously you'd also take N large. And then, if you think about it, the covering map, it's difficult to write down what the covering map is, but you can easily write down what the derivative of the covering map is. The derivative of the covering map must have zeros of order wi minus one at the critical points, and it must have double poles at all the poles of the covering map, because the covering map has simple poles, and therefore the derivative of the covering map will have double poles. So it must be of this form, and on the sphere, there is nothing left, so therefore there's just a constant here. So this fixes the derivative of the covering map completely except that you don't know the positions of the poles. So this specifies the covering map once you know what the, where the poles sit. Now, how are the poles constrained? Well, the poles are constrained by what Wompedakis calls the scattering equations. And these are the equations that demand that, you see, del gamma must have double poles, but it can't have any simple poles. I, the residue at z, um, at z equals to lambda a must be zero, because if it was non-zero and you integrated gamma, then gamma would contain a logarithm, but gamma can't contain a logarithm because it's a covering map from the sphere to the sphere. So you have to demand that the simple poles are absent. And if you work this out, this just leads to these, uh, what you call scattering equations. And now the idea was, or the observation was that this scattering equation in this funny gross mender type limit where you take the Ws and the Ns large, just looks like a matrix model equation, like, like the, 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 the usual matrix model equation. And it looks like a matrix model equation with that sort of matrix model potential, which are these panel-like potentials. So the alpha i's here are fixed. The alpha i's are part of specifying which twists you are, and you're trying to solve for the lambdas uh, that, uh, that solve this equation. Now, as you know, in the larger limits, the matrix model, these lambda, these uh, poles, Will, will condense into cuts and the spectral curve will, will take this form where the poles have to condense into cuts. And if you translate this into the picture of this uh, Feynman diagram, remember the poles are all the points that appear between in these pink surfaces. And when they condense to a cut, then basically the, the contour integral around them will tell you how many poles that you've had between say the i-th and the j-th vertex and that's a measure for how many legs you had in the Feynman diagram connecting the i-th and the j-th vertex in the larger end limit. Now, so the different solutions of the covering map get translated into all the solutions of the matrix model, which are described by all the different uh, cuts with, and uh, I mean, you have the cuts, but the, the parameters that characterize the different solutions are the contour integrals of the spectral curve around the cuts which is the fraction of weak contractions between the two corresponding vertices. So as you sum over all covering maps, you should sum over all such spectral curves with all possible values for this uh, contour integral around, uh, around these cuts. But the spectral curve, on the other hand, in the larger limit is equal to the Schwarzschild derivative. If you just explicitly plug in what you find when you use its definition, and the Schwarzschild derivative is a quadratic differential. So as a consequence, the covering, uh, the, the spectral curve is a quadratic differential, and it's a quadratic differential that has the property that the contour integral around all the cuts 
are real. Now, quadratic differentials with this property are called Strabel differentials. And it's a theorem of Strabel that the Strabel differentials are exactly cover the string moduli space once. So as you sum over all Strabel differentials, you sum over all points in the string moduli space. But that's exactly what we are instructed to do. We are instructed to sum over all the covering surfaces. The different covering surfaces or covering maps become the different solutions of this matrix model. The different solution of this matrix models are exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence to the different Strabel differentials. And therefore the sum over all the covering maps simply becomes the integral of a moduli space from the point of view of the dual CFT. So this is a perspective where we just started on the symmetric orbifold CFT and we've rewritten the prescription for how to, Lunin mature prescription for how to calculate it in terms of something that where naturally the integral of a moduli space of string theory emerges and it works via this Strabel differential that characterizes the different solutions to the matrix model, which are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the different covering maps and uh, that appear in the solution of Lunin and Matur. So you, you not only get something that looks like a world sheet uh, description, you can also read off the integrand and you can see the integrand looks like the number go to action in Strabel gauge, or you can write it as the absolute value of the Schwartz in action. So you, you can really rewrite this in terms of something that looks like a world sheet integral. And in fact, obviously our original analysis is exactly of this type, but here we've reproduced it being totally ignorant about what the world sheet theory should be, simply starting from the symmetric orbifold answer and rewriting it in this logic of this reconstruction idea of Rajesh Kopakuma. So I think it's very reassuring and very nice that also in this somewhat low dimensional example, you see this structure that was proposed primarily for ADS-5 or primarily to re recover uh, the string theory in ADS-5 from n equals to four super mills. This is exactly the same structure appears here and you reproduce a world sheet integral and you can read off the integrand from the dual CFT correlators. So I think my time is up given the fact that I started a little bit late but I should, uh, I should wrap up. So let me conclude. So I try to convince you that we have very good evidence that the symmetric orbifold of T4 in the larger limit is exactly dual to string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 with one unit of nervous Schwartz flux. We've shown that the spectrum agrees precisely and the symmetric orbifold correlators are reproduced from the world sheet by means of all of these magic identities. The world sheet plays the role of the covering surface of the symmetric orbifold. And in some sense that suggests the way in which you can make this in some sense manifest. I mean, you shouldn't, on a certain level, you want to turn this into something where you don't have to check it anymore. You can just see that it has to work. And in particular, this suggests that this will work to all orders in one over n, because remember the one over n corrections from the symmetric orbifold are related to the genus of the covering surface. The covering surface is the world sheet. So that's the higher genus contributions from the world sheet, exactly as you would expect. And some work checking the higher genus versions of these uh, correlation functions has been done by my former PhD student and my current PhD student. Then uh, the world sheet theory exhibits signs of a topological string theory. There are only short representations of PSU 1,1 slash 2 that appear. That is uh, somehow, it feels a bit like uh, topological. This correlation function have this funny delta function property. So this probably is some sort of topological sector that uh, characterizes this. Both sides are explicitly solvable. They have free field realizations. So this is a, 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 an example where you can test this uh, to an enormous degree of, uh, of detail and, uh, and under, analyze all sorts of aspects of it. And finally, we've seen that this fits naturally into this general framework in how you would believe that the world sheet should emerge from the dual CFT by virtue of this Strabel differential dictionary. Now, there are many things to do. So obviously this uh, Strabel differential, this matrix model, there are many open questions which it would be interesting to understand. How does this work at finite end? Can you do it without this limit? What's the role of the Schwartz and what exactly is the action? How does it work at higher genus? One of the things we are currently working on is uh, trying to understand it as a, the topological aspect of it. We feel there should be a way of making this more manifest and then Obviously the final aim is to generalize it to ADS-5. We are somewhat reasonably hopeful that some of these, in particular, given the fact that this reconstruction idea works so similarly, we feel that there may be a good chance that 
one may be able to do something similar for the case of ADS5. I find the string theory describing strings on ADS5 quads S5 that's dual to free super Hilbert theory. So we think there is a, a reasonable chance that something along these lines could work. And um, that's also something we're looking a little bit into. So with this, uh, I'll stop. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, let's thank Matthias. And let's take maybe a five minute break. I'll stop the recording and then we'll come back for discussions.